my presentation. Um, morning, men. Um, um, as was introduced, I'm giving a presentation on uh, benefits of receiving Holy Communion frequently. Uh, to really understand why it's important to receive the Eucharist frequently, we really got to understand its context. You know, what is Holy Communion? What does it represent? Etc. Um, so as we know, so I'm going to be drawing up on the board a lot. If you can't see something or something doesn't make sense, or if I say something that doesn't make sense, just ask questions. If I can't answer it, I will find an answer. Or I'll just defer to Don and I'll force Don to answer it. Okay, so all throughout Salvitic history, we've been preparing for Christ, right? The Jews in the Old Testament were preparing for the Savior, right? And so they're, they're moving up to prepare for the Savior. And what was their tradition on offering sacrifices? Why do they need to offer sacrifices? For sin, right? And we know that um, the priest had to offer two sacrifices, right? Once for themselves, and then once for the people. Okay? So we always keep that in mind, that in the old, in, in, the, in the Judaic times, it was always two sacrifices. Always two, always two, okay? And then moving forward, so, so we have this continual loop of always offering sacrifices because of the, the need for the priest to say the first sacrifice for his own sins, the remediation for that, and then for the people. There's a separation there, right? So as we, as we progress through, we reach the time of Christ, and of course, his one sacrifice. <clears throat> His death. Okay. Now, because he's God, and because he himself is an eternal priest, and he is our high priest, his sacrifice is eternal. Right? It's one sacrifice. Only one. And that sacrifice is eternal. Okay. So what ends up happening is that, well, what happens going forward in the future? Right. Well, he instituted, he gave us an ability to, to bring forward his sacrifice and to experience his sacrifice here in the now, in the day. Okay? And so we can continually bring forward and plant in the day and experience his sacrifice. Because it's eternal, and because we're doing it as per his command. Right? And of course, with ordained priests and, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And why do we do this? Why do we bring forward his sacrifice into today and re experience it every, every single day? Okay? And this is for numerous reasons, as the Catechism outlines. Okay? One of which is for sin. Okay. It explicitly states um, that with sin that we let me let me back up. Holy Eucharist, when we receive the Holy Eucharist, our venial sins are washed away. They are purified. Okay. Fine line. The Catechism explicitly states. The Eucharist cannot unite us to Christ without at the same time cleansing us from past sins and preserving us from future sins. So every time that we receive, we are emboldened within Christ, by Christ. Because, he, because when we receive Him, we abide in Him and He abides in us. Right? Patrick, what paragraph is that in the Catholic? That's an excellent question. That paragraph is from 1393. I'll be pulling most of my quotes from the 1320s to the 13, almost 1400s from the Catechism. There's a few others that I have that are outside that. I wanted, I wanted to read, read you something uh, that talks about um, this brain forward um, of Christ's sacrifice uh, that the Catechism quotes. At the Last Supper, on the night he was betrayed, our Savior instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood. 
He did this in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until he should come again. And so to trust to his beloved spouse, the church, a memorial of his death and resurrection, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet, in which Christ is consumed, the mind is filled with grace, and the pledge of future glory is given to us. So that this sacrifice might be a sign, might be, might be, and, and, and bringing it forward in our daily life might be a small foretaste, just a small foretaste, of what is to come in heaven. Because as this sacrifice is eternal, you know, the angels and the saints and whatnot, what are they doing in heaven? They're praising God. You know, they're, they're, they're experiencing this sacrifice of Christ at the, at the altar in heaven. And so we get the small little foretaste as, the, as, as we go up to heaven. Okay? So that we, we can kind of incrementally small, have a small little experience every single day of what that is. And that process help emboldens us. Yeah. I listed four things, uh, or the, the text listed four things that I enumerated. A sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet. Right? The paschal banquet is quite obvious, that's Christ. Right? The sacrament of love and the, and the bond of charity go, go hand in hand with one another. The catechism outlines very clearly how within... The, that the reception of, of Holy Communion unifies us in many different aspects. It unifies us with Christ Himself, and therefore we become transformed. You know, we we we, can, we because we are fed by Him and He abides in us. You know, Christ. Everything that Christ does and says has action. Right. We see this throughout the Bible. He says something, it happens, right? Because, you know, God's word is effective. It has effect. And he being God has effect. So, when we receive him, it's just, just not inert. When we receive the word of God made flesh, present in the sacrifice, in Holy Communion, we ourselves, action happens, effect happens. And what, what is that? One of that is the washing away of sins, of venial sins, like I mentioned earlier. But also, it helps, con it helps um, bring us in closer charity with him. It turns us, it turns our minds to help to, to offer better charity to the people around us. I mean, we all work. We all know what it's like to have bad days. And we all feel how our ability to to be charitable to those around us gets eroded away with the day. You know, and when we're at the end of the day and we haven't had, or we're at the end of the week and we haven't had a good week, you know, we're uh, snappy, grouchy, etc. Uh, I'm sure our significant others appreciate that. <laughs> but to, um, and so that's a sign that as we go through our day, we're worn down, we feel tired, we feel, we're, uh, that this slowly, um, our ability to be nice to one another, to share charity, and to love others gets decreased throughout the week, right? And so part of what this does, of receiving Holy Communion, more specifically receiving it oftenly, okay, is that sacrament of love, that bond of charity. It, it, it brings within us the love of God and allows us to go out and share that. What does the deacon send forth? Sends us forth with. The word of God. Right. By the way, you live your life. Huh? By your actions. By your actions or by your life. Right. We just received Christ, the Word of God made flesh. Cool. The Word of God made flesh. We are to go out and go share. 
the good news, not only the good news of the Bible, but also by our lives, by living it. Okay? And we are just fed with the spiritual food of heaven. The saints have always talked about uh, the Eucharist being the bread from heaven. You know, that heavenly food. Um, I'm sure Don has some really great, great, great quotes off the top of his head with that. I don't have any. I, Christ, himself, Christ himself said in the sixth chapter of John that he was the bread from heaven. So. Can't get any better than that. Yeah. <laughs> Touche on the quotes there. <laughs> And so, we have a multifaceted um, aspect here of receiving Christ, not only weekly but daily. And the reason why we should receive Him as often as we can, generally speaking, you know, for some of us that are busy, you know, it's can't make as often as we'd like. But there's significant benefits to receiving Christ often, sincerely, and openly. Okay. Um, one of the other items that I enumerated was a sign of unity. Okay? When we receive Christ's body and blood, and how we are brought to closer unity with Him, because He resides in us at that moment, but that also means that we are able to become closer, not only with Him physically, but also with Him as part of the mystical body of the church. You know, and we are brought to a closer communion with that, with with that with that entity, and therefore we are brought closer to the church itself. the The whole, Holy Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life. I mean, this is it. This is you know some uh, one of one of the great quotes. I think it was you, Don, I mentioned, or you, you, Linda, that mentioned it. Um, somebody who once said. If you truly believe that is the body and blood of Jesus Christ, why aren't you crawling up to receive him? Um, I forget the whole quote. I'm, I'm, I'm mashing that. But the other, you know, some of our um, some of our Protestant brothers and sisters don't fully understand. Uh, the real presence, and therefore don't understand, oh, well, okay, you know, why, you know, I don't, don't really understand why we need to receive often, you know, because of this, of this continual washing of our sins, um, and this continual emboldening of our, of us, that Christ comes and emboldens us. He also enriches the graces, the life that we received at baptism. Because our baptism is rooted in in his sacrifice, in his death, when we are buried with him and we rise again with him, every time that we receive the Eucharist, we are, our baptismal graces are enriched, are given new life, are renewed in him because we are sharing it once again in the original sacrifice that he made, that the eternal sacrifice that he made. Does anybody have any questions? Can you expand on the reason for the, the, the blood? It seems like pre vatican season. Sure. And during flu season, right. you say, well, you need this Eucharist, but the rest of the time, do you really need the body and blood, or well, are you getting it all within the Eucharist? You are getting it all within the Eucharist. Uh, the Church teaches a doctrine of concomitance, which represents, which basically means that the smallest particle of the host contains his body, blood, soul, and divinity. That although it is good to receive in both species, the body and the blood, and the, in, in, in the form of the bread and the wine, although it is not necessary, that we, we, we theologically believe that they are wholly present in each other. Um, and that's, that's an excellent question. So, in each other, so you could just take the wine? Yes, technically you can. Yeah, for somebody, for example, who has a gluten allergy or has that yeah. other, I can't remember what, the, what it's called, people, what's it called? Yeah. yeah. Um, and we have a couple of people like that in the parish. 
they would only receive communion in the form of wine, which is the, the, the blood of Christ. Traditionally speaking, it has always been in, in, the, in the form of the bread that, that the, the majority of people have received, um, and that when possible, we have had both species. Uh, the church does recognize that you can, and, and generally speaking, those are medical conditions and whatnot. Yes? Whose decision is it uh, that you have both, as, for example, at Daily Mass, we have both here, mm -hmm. and most of the churches in their diocese, forward diocese, mm -hmm. John, we have both. We went the other day to St. Monica's John, mm -hmm. Daily Mass, and they only have the Eucharist, uh, and they do not. Up the right. um, First of all, that'll be the decision of the, of the pastor. Well, the that'll be the pastor decision. Furthermore, that would then roll up and do the bishop, the bishop's decision, or the diocese. So, that's my question. There, is it the pastor's decision, or is it the well? Bishop? I would I would say that it would first be the pastor's decision. Okay. Um, that he he may have. And I would, I would expect him to have um, a description of why he would want to handle that. Uh, but I know for the DOS in an office, there's yeah. um, you know, there's times, like you said, blue season. Um, I just thought of it, just answer my own question. Okay. Mary Immaculate is part of that diocese, and they have both. Yes. yes. This week on Catholic Radio, I heard something that. Uh, really uh, was very, it was great to hear mm -hmm. on consubstantiation. Mm -hmm. uh, are you familiar with what this all means? Yes. That the entire, complete, every physical bit of the host and the wine is totally transformed into Jesus Christ, not just parts of it. Right. The smallest part of it. Yeah. And you just touched on that. Mm -hmm. in that uh, and I had in my mind that it's only certain small parts of the host and mm. the wine was, con was, con was Jesus Christ. That's what I thought until I heard that. I right. said, oh my gosh. This is one of the reasons. Fantastic. This is one of the reasons why they take so much care is taken in cleaning the vessels afterwards, mm -hmm. and why only particular people yeah. can yeah. clean the vessels. Yeah. And it's yeah. one of the reasons why we should be very careful when we go receive communion, for example, in our hands, to make sure that we don't have any remnants of our Lord on our hand. And we need to be very respectful of that uh, when we do that. And if you think about it, it's very biblical as well. If you, if you recall the story of the multiplication of the loaves, mm -hmm. one of the last things they do, the apostles do, is go pick up all the remnants. And so you kind of see a foreshadowing of how we treat our Lord in the Eucharist in Scripture. And, and the old church, too, you yeah, know, the officer would carry a hat and yep. just in case there was any yep. dropping. I'd love for something. us to go back to that. And, uh, and, 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 and the servers were told, just hold the handle. Mm -hmm. You weren't supposed to touch any of it. Mm -hmm. And then you gave it to the priest, and he wiped it off to you know, make sure that there was yeah. Even a drop. Patrick, what part of the during the mass? What was the term there that you just used? Consubstantiation. Why did you want to the father? Tell them when the bells ring. <laughs> yeah. Okay. At that. What part? Can you kind of go through the? Sure. What's father sure. doing at the time? The more the more accurate time uh, is term is transubstantiation, because we believe in the full conversion. We don't believe that they are that it is. In addition to what is there, we believe that the body and the, I'm sorry, the, the bread and the wine fully become, are fully transformed. They don't, they don't coexist. No, it's full transformation. That's why we use the word transubstantiation. Yeah. Explain when that takes place. Yeah, what, yeah, when that takes place. It's an excellent question. Um, I would say that it takes place pro as a process in two parts. One, when the priest takes his hands and does this during the epiclesis. And then a quick bell is right. The then the bells are right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So as he brings down his, his hands like this, he's bringing, calling down the Holy Spirit yeah. upon the gifts. 
Okay? And then at the second time, when he then takes the gifts, brings it close, like the host, and says, and he says some words, this is my body. And at that time, he's acting what's called in persona Christi. So he is acting in the person of Christ, bringing forward himself, now present here. What's the Latin term you just said? Impersoni Christi. Okay. Yeah. Which means he is the person of Christ at that point. And that's why you got you got your altar servers and acolytes up here. That's where they want stillness in the in the church. Yeah. Because the priest is concentrating, he's focused, yeah. he's in in the zone, so to speak. Yeah. And he doesn't need people wandering around, going to the bathroom and all this other crap that happens. Right. Okay. So yeah. that's that's pretty serious time of the mass. Yeah. And that's why when those bells are ringing, you're saying, Hey guys, wake up, get off your cell phones. Yes, focus on the altar. Well, there's a traditional aspect of that is they had um, people needed to know because in the old in the old way the priest's back was facing the people, and they couldn't understand mass. They didn't know what was coming up, so the bells were rung to kind of, hey, you're about to see the epiclesis. Um, and in the eastern rite, it's even um, it's even more. Uh, stark of a contrast because they have a partition dividing the area around the altar from the main congregation. And so all they do see is the epiclesis and the high elevation after that. I yeah. know you're about to get the hook, but you want to talk about mortal <laughs> sin versus... Sure, that's actually a really great well, question. We're trying, um, the reason why we bat, when, uh, you'll notice on the altar, the servers, whenever we interact with Father, we always bow. We're not bowing because of respect for Father. We're bowing because he's in persona Christi. That's the person of Christ. Yeah. So we're bowing for that purpose. Yeah. It's not like Christ comes in and overshadows the priest at that time. No. Christ is present in him. He is Christ. Yeah. Uh, I have a really great quote, a little really great quote on uh, venial sin. Um, and you know what? I really can't say it better than this. So I'm just going to read it if that's okay. Venial sin weakens charity. It manifests a disordered affection for created good, goods. It impedes the soul's progress in the exercise of virtues and the practice of the moral good. It merits temporal punishment. Deliberate and unrepentant venial sin disposes us little by little to commit mortal sin. Clogs up our soul. However, venial sin does not break the covenant with God. With God's grace, it is humanly, humanly repairable. Reparable, sorry, reparable. And they have, they have a subquote: venial sin does not deprive the sinner of sanctifying grace, friendship with God, charity, or consequently eternal happiness. And when you receive the Eucharist, it removes venial sin. Right, but I guess my point was more, if you're not in a state of grace, you can, well, I can I say Sunday. that real quick so we can move on? All right, mortal sin, all right, you know I have a legal background, so I'm going to give you the elements of the crime, so to speak. All right? So the, the elements of mortal sin are threefold. One, it must be a grave matter. Okay, a good way to identify that is it breaks one of the Ten Commandments. And when in doubt, you can look it up in the Catechism, of what a grave matter is, because in the catechism it'll point out that something is grave matter. For example, it specifically says in the catechism that pornography, the viewing of pornography, is a grave matter. That means if you've gone online and deliberately looked at pornography, you have committed a mortal sin. So that's the second element, is that you know, you know that it's a grave matter. Okay, so knowingly, so those, you, know, you, you know this terminology. Uh, so, it's grave matter, you know it's a grave matter, and you freely and willfully commit it. So, yeah, you know it's a grave matter, and you, it's a grave matter, you know it's a grave matter, and then you willfully do it. Okay? And so, my, my short answer to that is, don't play lawyer ball with God. When in doubt, go to reconciliation. Does that make sense? Yep. Alright, so I want to sum up Patrick's entire talk with this phrase that my mom taught me. A long, long time ago, Mom used to say, and you've heard this before, you are what you eat. And the more that you eat Christ 
in the Eucharist, the more you can't help but become more like him. And so, if I were to wrap it up, did you get, just get a chill? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then that's, that's a good motivator for going uh, to Mass daily if you can. Okay? And if not, try to just do it one day. Okay? You know, masstimes.org will tell you where all the Mass times are locally to you. And we're very blessed in the area that we have a, a number of different churches if you can't make our Mass. All right, so real quick, the other thing, I want to give you one resource that you can use, okay? And I'll post up a couple, because there have been a couple encyclicals, especially during the year of the Eucharist, that uh, Blessed John Paul II wrote about this, that will just really open your eyes of what we're receiving in the Eucharist. Uh, if you wanted to get a good, small book about this, the best book that, that I know that's been written about the Eucharist is Scott Hahn's book called The Lamb's Supper, Okay? They have it online, uh, audio version of it. Yeah, so you can get an audio version of it. Uh, I, I listen to a lot of audio books and I find that you retain more when you actually physically read the book. Oh, yeah. okay. All right, so Lennon's going to talk about Maximilian Colby.